This episode is brought to you by SoRare. Stay tuned for more information on them later in the episode. What's up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, and this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast, where twice a week, I talk to your favorite personalities from the worlds of Bitcoin, finance, trading, art, music, sports, and politics, basically anyone with a good story to tell. Now, back in 2019, a small company with an ambitious vision was launched. Elrond set out to build an internet economy for the world by bringing a 1,000x improvement or more in blockchain speed, scale, cost, and user experience. Excited to participate in the Elrond story, I and a lot of my followers actually bought some of the tokens and kept up with Benjamin and Elrond's journey. As of right now, Elrond has broken through all-time highs in price, and there are a number of fundamental moves to discuss. As requested by a number of my listeners and for my own curiosity, I brought Benjamin Minku back onto the show for another deep dive into the Elrond project to learn about everything they have going on. So Benjamin, it's a pleasure to speak with you again, and thanks for coming back. Hey, Scott. It's really, really great to be here. Thanks for, for the invitation. Uh, of course, always a pleasure. So as I mentioned in the intro, and the one thing I think got a lot of people's mind, obviously the coin eGold has just gone on a huge run, broken through all time highs. But can you talk about what you think is fueling the recent run? Obviously, what's happening fundamentally and why this could be happening? Um, I think there are, there are two things here. Um, first of all, uh, it seems to me that um, fundamentally, as we discussed last time, uh, we're at the beginning of a super cycle. Um, some things are happening in the blockchain space and in the technology world that are changing the premises of how the economy works. And especially for the blockchain and crypto space, I, I think the next period will be incredible in terms of opportunities and, and so forth. And um, especially the applications that we will see uh, will open up new markets uh, with a lot of opportunities for people around the world. Now, more specifically to Elrond, um, we've made a huge amount of progress since our last conversation. Uh, we've had uh, many, many launches, improvements, partnerships, collaborations, and so forth. And now we're at the point where the network is live, the Meyer application is live, smart contracts are live, and now we're just about to start a massive next growth cycle. Uh, why? Well, the DeFi part is coming on Elrond. We have the Myr Dex that we've been working on for months now, and it's finally ready to be battle tested. In fact, tomorrow we're starting the Battle of Yields competition with 100K for people that want to, to break the Myr Dex or contribute to it. Then NFTs are coming live on Elrond. The Meyer Launchpad is coming live on Elrond. Um, the US can now buy eGold in the Meyer application and a lot more. So we're super, super um, excited for the next period to come. Can you talk more about what you touched on on a macro level? Why you believe this is such an integral point in time and what we can look for coming? Um, yeah, so if you look fundamentally at the macro level, I think most people are too close to what's happening right now to process the signals that we see in the market, to read them and, and then interpret them correctly. But if you look at it, the market is not behaving at all as we used to see it. The cycles do not go as they would normally. Now, the question is, why is this happening? Of course, there are several interpretations here, but uh, one of the elements that uh, I've been seeing over and over again is that now we have, even if you look only at the crypto and blockchain space, a space that has grown from nothing to trillion dollars. And now we are all of a sudden here with millions of people making a living in this new industry with millions of people um, uh, leaving the most important, ambitious and, and lucrative industries around the world and moving to the crypto space. Why are they doing this? Well, it's clear that financially, there's a larger opportunity here than any other industry. And perhaps even more important, I do believe that during the next period, we'll see perhaps the largest high impact societal opportunity here. So when you can build a new financial system 
to connect people around the world, to give them a different opportunity that they did not have access to until now. Um, it's, this is not only for the US, this is for many, many countries around the world. And um, it's this type of combination of both creativity and accessibility to new people um, around the world in developing countries that makes this space um, especially interesting. Now, in addition to this, I, I'm also uh, looking very closely and, and have been uh, researching and studying a few other fields that I believe at, are at an inflection point. Uh, and during the next decade, we'll probably have some um, seemingly or yeah, seemingly crazy things happening in those sectors. One is genetics and, and longevity. I do believe that uh, it seems we're close uh, to, to some very important breakthroughs um, here. And, and um, there are a number of those uh, being discussed every day now. Secondly, of course, artificial intelligence with, with everything we're seeing with Tesla and some other companies, OpenAI and, and DeepMind and, and so forth. Um, the rocket space and space industry, this is... Uh, yeah, going to a crazy level. Again, if you look at what Musk is doing and then several other companies are attempting and also achieving, it's, it's very, very remarkable. And then um, there are some other sectors as well where you see a lot of opportunity. But the interesting thing right now is that wherever you look, there's an opportunity. It's almost like we've, we've never had this type of time where um, whether you're in the stock market, whether you're in the crypto space, whether in, you're in the technology space, real estate space, and, and so forth. Um, this is super, super surprising and remarkable. And so I do believe that this is just the beginning of a very, very significant shift. And it's a great time to be alive and be able to shape this opportunity, accelerate it. And the blockchain space is, is doing this um, very, very well. Often these changes take generations in the past, right? It takes a whole new thinking, a generation to die off and younger people who understand technology to replace them. But I've heard the argument that this time will be different because of the exponential speed with which technology is increasing. So do you think that these huge changes are something that we see a generation later? Or do you really believe that five, 10 years, the world looks like a completely different place? I. I like trying to make this a, a bit even more um, specific. I think that um, one of the reasons why everything will accelerate tremendously is not only technology, but the fact that we are very likely going to reach a point where, especially in the blockchain space, we're going to see, for instance, several trillion dollar networks. This means that beyond Bitcoin, beyond Ethereum, we'll not see one winner and um, th that winner takes, takes it all, but rather we're going to see several networks that capture and onboard different parts of the world with different use cases. When this happens, the implications are very hard to overstate, but it's like during the next decade, crypto networks will likely exert more influence on the lives of people than countries did. And when this happens, everything changes. I, I mean, uh, the way you live your life, the way you earn your money, the way you build um, value and create things will rely much more on this space than the physical world, um, the, the uh, geographical distribution of, of different resources and so forth. So this alone, with the fact that we will um, cross in several networks trillion dollar markets, I think will enable most of the people to, to finally ask the deeper questions. The interesting things that is all often neglected in the crypto space is um, we're, we're basically discovering, uh, discussing what's happening right now, always discussing what's happening um, today, tomorrow, one week, one month for now. But the question is, how will the world look in three years, in five years, in 10 years? It's super interesting to see, as I said, 
the DeFi part um, uh, unfolding before our eyes and building this, this new product. Super interesting to see the NFT space with the creativity and artists joining and, and so forth. But going one step beyond this, I think most of the people, it's like never ask themselves what happens when you finally made enough money to not care about money anymore at all. Like when you could literally go in any country of this world, start businesses or solve different problems or spend your time however you want. And I do think that we've never lived a period where so many people around the world could be part of this opportunity because this is fundamentally not a zero sum game. And this is also what ties Elrond together to, to um, everything we're seeing because we're, we're not here, as I mentioned even last time, we're not the Bitcoin killer, the Ethereum killer or whatever other uh, project killer. Uh, we're not interested in that. That's, that's a very small zero sum game. If you understand that the market capitalizations uh, that we're seeing right now are a function of value and users inside this market, then the only question you need to ask even for a network like Elrond, in order to reason what it would take for Elrond to exceed a trillion dollar market, as outrageous as it sounds right now, is how many users do you really need for this type of economics um, and, and so forth to really kick off this feedback loop? Is it 10 million users? Is it 20 million users? It, it almost seems uh, frightening to say this out loud, but um, if you look at the, the real fundamentals, the, the, the thing is that beyond 20 million users, uh, you almost see very clearly that this type of $1 trillion threshold could be, could be exceeded. And then the question is what happens with the market once you bring hundreds of millions of users in, once the users can really join and do what they, what they always wanted to do. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm almost convinced that during the next five to 10 years, we're going to leave a period that's unparalleled uh, to anything that we've seen in history. And I, I do think that in res retrospect, we'll, we'll have to call it the roaring 20s. So quite, quite excited about this. I love that. What is Elrond's theoretical role in that new world? You're obviously building very quickly, as you said, you know, and for every project, I think in this space, you start with one idea and then you evolve consistently with all the possibilities, NFTs, DeFi, DEX, all those things. What's the ideal role if that's what the world looks like for a platform like yours? Um, so the, the basic and fundamental goal of Elrond um, is to basically build the backbone for a high bandwidth low latency transparent financial system and give anyone anywhere easy access to this financial system. And why we're focusing on these two fundamental elements is because um, precisely, it's precisely these two elements that we believe will accelerate and bring about this um, super cycle that we're discussing about. On the one hand, it's clear that um, blockchain is still here to stay and will open a tremendous uh, space of opportunities. The question is how fast can we move from dial up to broadband? How fast can we have a network on top of which you can really build the businesses that make sense and that, that essentially enable you to build whatever you want? This is what Elrond does on a network level. This is why we brought this improvement of more than 1000 X in throughput scalability uh, and, and transaction speed and transaction cost. And then more than that, once you've solved this, uh, the question is how do you enable a simplicity with which users from all over the world can interact with this technology? Suppose they want to just send money to friends around the world. How can you enable them to do this instantly at a trivial cost and anywhere in the world with super simple, a, a super simple user experience. And beyond Elrond, Maiar is really taking this technology and repackaging it in a way to enable the simple users to interact with it. 
Um, and on top of this, um, NFTs have a different meaning. They're not about the technology. They're about some cool thing that you as an artist or you as a creative person can share with your community, but it's super simple to do it. Um, even DeFi becomes a very different meaning. Like it's one thing to go about through this entire process and provide liquidity and then have slippage and have all this process. And then another thing to be able to have a savings product with underlying mechanics of DeFi. And then as a savings product, this is appealing for almost anyone in the world. Even our grandma can understand this. Savings are savings. You just need to handle them in a, in a, a smart way and risks should be managed and, and so forth. But um, these are the two elements that I believe will more than anything enable this opportunity to really happen um, beyond the hype and then accelerate it. Because at the end of the day, what I believe will be the, the sort of threshold for the end game to become obvious for most people is 1 billion people joining this space. Once you have crossed this element, that's the end game there. Um, beyond that point, nothing will really matter because at that point, this economy becomes the default economy. Um, and, and the normal old economy becomes the sort of strange thing you're looking at the way you're looking at uh, the TV right now. So the idea is 20 million people is a tipping point for a single blockchain or platform and a billion for the entire ecosystem. So a billion people interacting with crypto, but if 20 million were interacting directly with Elrond, that would give you the chance for hyper growth and for a trillion market cap. Is that correct? Yeah, so this, this of course, could happen a lot faster yeah. um, because th this is not a, a, a fixed function there. Uh, it depends on how much uh, and how, how much different users would like to, to um, own of the Elrond ecosystem and, and so forth. But it also gives you a, a rough ballpark of how immediate and close this change is. It's not something that we're discussing about um, uh, like fictional elements, but something very, very specific based on numbers that you can calculate. And then this becomes just a, a question of how fast can we really bring those users in? How fast can we solve them, uh, these problems? And then uh, for the ecosystem, this, this will seem like um, crazy. Uh, a, a crazy period to, to be part of and, and uh, contribute to the ecosystem. At this point in time, who are you seeing as the early adopters? Who's willing to opt out of that system? It's not the grandmas yet, right? The idea is that we get to the grandmas, we get to the average person, but in general, crypto is still complicated for most people. I think we can agree. Sure. So who are you seeing initially that's you know, adopting and passionate about the platform and about crypto in general? I think we've seen um, a lot of different people uh, gradually starting to play with this technology. Of course, some of the people that um, initially came in were, the, as we know, the cyberpunks. Then it was developers. Uh, then, then it was a lot of entrepreneurs and, and so forth. Then it was a lot of investors, uh, especially retail investors. Now, recently, we've seen institutional investors coming in in hordes. Um, and then whenever such institutional investors come in, um, they, they're really elephants in the room. It's not like someone is coming in with a few thousand dollars and, and so forth. Um, you almost every day start to see a billion dollar invested by this person and that person and this institution and that institution. So. I generally think that it's almost like we have three phases here. There's a bootstrapping phase for this entire ecosystem where um, we're gradually with even a more rapid speed each passing day approaching this critical mass point um, where the space is growing. Of course, there's volatility, there's uncertainty and, and change and, and so forth. But things as a trend, are generally very, very clear. The more you zoom out, the clearer the, 
the fundamentals are and the trend is, um, irrespective of what's happening on the short term. Second, I think the really important thing is, again, what's happening once a critical uh, mass is reached. So um, you have retail investors joining, but now there's a bigger and more significant trend starting with companies investing their corporate balances in crypto. Now, this again is something that seems small until you understand the significance uh, of, of this element and until you see that here's where most of the money in the world really is. And, and so this is going to be super interesting to um, see both in the US and in Europe. It's interesting that in the US, this is happening, but in Europe, it's not happening yet. Now, one of the elements would be, uh, uh, that would be interesting to see is what happens when a fund similar to macro strategy is started for Elrond, specifically only long Elrond, giving the corporates a very simple vehicle to interact and uh, gain some exposure and then build their portfolio on top and, and so forth. It's only a question of time until you can have a compelling enough story for most of the companies to start considering um, this as more lucrative, important and compelling than what they're doing as a core business. Uh, and this is, this is also a bit scary because then what happens when investors that sit on the boards of these corporations start seeing that you can make 10x of what you would with your normal company and then start pressuring the companies to move in this direction and, and so forth. So it's, uh, this is um, a trend that will be super interesting to watch. But then retail is in, corporates are coming in. The question is, at what point do you exceed the threshold, as I said, where you're sort of in this situation where you're in a post-scarcity world? You've solved the money problem. Uh, of course, you'll still do cool stuff that you enjoy, but not for the money per se. What happens to the world then? Um, how will you live your day? I, I mean, this is super interesting even for the many people in the crypto space, for people that make their money until yesterday. They, they were doing their nine to five jobs and, and so forth. And now they have a tremendous opportunity. Um, I think just yesterday, someone from the community wrote a, a super long message about them um, doing their normal job a few years back and now uh, just crossing the first million dollars um, in Eagle and, and so forth. And this is super remarkable because these people are not here for the short term their life has changed and they want to do something different with their lives. And this is a different story. Here, we need to have a lot of conversations of what's super useful to do once you have crossed that threshold. What are the interesting problems that you yourself want to solve, that you yourself want to tackle, maybe with your friends, maybe with your family and, and so forth. But that's fundamentally a 100 times more interesting world than the one we live today. It, it almost seems like if you could do one thing and one single thing, it should be accelerating the point at which most of the people uh, in the world have an incomparably larger opportunity and don't really have to care about money. At that point, you could accelerate arguably um, all the interesting sciences, all the interesting engineering, engineering projects, and then solve some fundamental uh, problems just as an indirect consequence of enabling this new, this new world that we live in. So it's, it's yeah, super interesting. We're, we're, <laughs> we're living some, uh, a period at which um, I think many of the problems we worry about will not come to be. And some problems that we never worried about will perhaps be a bit more interesting and challenging to, to think about. Yeah, you and I have talked about that very concept both publicly and privately a number of times that effectively the goal is to unlock time, right? Because time is the true currency. It's the thing that people lack the most and it's the thing that's truly scarce and finite. 
right? So obviously financial freedom gives you the freedom to use your time as you see fit and therefore unlocks innovation and, and entrepreneurship on a level that we've never seen. I'm actually interested to see if that happens, how many people would have something that they're so passionate about that they would actually pursue it? Yeah, I, I would say that a surprising amount of people would actually do something like this, but it also takes a bit of education and time to shift the mindset because uh, there, there's a lot of baggage there that, that you, you are raised up with, that you're taught things should be a certain way. And then you have to sort of discover things for yourself. You have to hit your head against the wall many times until you find this opportunity can go through with, with some thoughts that you have. And um, I think it's, it's super interesting that this opportunity is now available for most people around the world to have something like this, not closed to the US, but um, open to, to any country in the world, as long as you can read and, and research and do stuff like that. That's a, a super, super interesting thing to, to say, to be able to say out loud. I mean, at this moment, the world seems to be going in the opposite direction. I think if you're in crypto, maybe you understand the potential, but I think if you're the average person working a job, you don't get a raise, you make the same amount of money, goods become more expensive, obviously inflation destroys savings. How does your average person pivot from that system to this one? And how long does that take? Is that just a function of we get to enough people, enough of their friends are talking about it, they take the risk, it happens? Or is it a complete mindset shift? No, I, I would say that it's the first case. Uh, in fact, in the past, um, some, some interesting books have been written about the great stagnation that for tens of years after a kind of golden age that we've seen, um, despite tremendous progress in computer science, most of the other fields have not yielded um, important breakthroughs or significant improvements. And thus the economy has not seen a large enough growth to, to let's say spread the wealth to enough people. I don't think that argument stands. So it's an interesting argument to explore intellectually, but I don't think it stands. It has some merit to it because there are some, some fields like for instance, space exploration that after um, the Apollo landing, for some strange reason, it seemed like we, we went 100 years back in time. Nothing was happening. Uh, in fact, everything was sort of decelerating instead of accelerating. But I think we're now at the point where more and more people are discovering to their, their friends just by trial and error that this is an, an opportunity that's super interesting and that they can explore it a bit this is this uh, doesn't need to be all at once you don't need to go all in uh, this this doesn't need to uh, be a shift like that from one day to another but when the people discover this i see this all the time it's like at first it seems unreal but then you're looking at things there are of course challenges I i'm not saying everything is super well in the crypto space that there are no challenges, no scams and so forth. There will be always challenges, but the net positive is so large compared to the challenges that, as I said, for most of the people, um, people in India or in Eastern Europe can invest at better terms than Peter Thiel in startups around the world, provided they have the insight to validate those elements. And so, yeah, Overall, I think accessibility is there. Everyone can um, have the opportunity um, and, and um, it's up to them. It's still up to the people to seize the opportunity, move forward and make something of it. Um, because yeah, you can see everything, you can talk about it, but if you don't do something, 10 years from now, you'll still be in the same place.
Do you love sports collectibles or fantasy sports as much as I do? So Rare is blending this together to create an entirely new gaming experience powered by its community. So Rare cards are officially licensed NFTs from over 160 clubs, including Real Madrid, Paris Saint Germain, and Liverpool, and all built on Ethereum. You truly own your collectibles. They are productive gaming assets that will generate rewards if you're a good fantasy player like me. Join SoRare and connect with your favorite teams, live the game with passion, and earn weekly prizes. You can do all of this at the wolfofallstreets.link slash SoRare. So a huge argument consistently through the crypto community, especially from Bitcoiners, obviously, is that security is paramount, right? And that proof of work is the most secure network. I'm curious what you sacrifice, if anything, you know, to lower latency and increase speed what does that mean on the other side? Does that decrease security? Are there risks? How do you mitigate that if there are? I do think that Bitcoiners, by and large, tend to, uh, tend to distort the definitions a bit to make them um, uh, basically seem like there's no way you can explain what you're building without um, the answer being as a, uh, almost a handicap. So. I, I would um, push back a bit on, on those definitions and say this, that um, if you think about it, uh, starting from, from first principles, um, irrespective of what projects you're looking at, fundamentally, we will reach a point where you can exchange money through space and time um, in an optimal way. Through space, it will mean that um, you'll be able to send money anywhere in the world instantly with a trivial cost. You'll not care about any of those elements. And once you can do that, the entire economy will essentially shift a gear up because the entire financial system will flow a lot rapidly and um, you, you'll have everything you have now just working 100 times faster. This is one element. And then a second element is Suppose you have solved this problem, uh, but then now the question is, how can you conserve the value throughout time? It's not only exchanging the value and um, spreading it and, and buying different things and so forth, but conserving the value over time in some particular currency is a very, very different problem than just exchanging value. Um, and so then the question is, what's the ideal? system through which you can solve this? The answer should be any system that can enable you to first exchange value, as I said, instantly with anyone in the world at a trivial cost with a very, very simple and compelling UX should be very, very near to the optimal point. The, the more nearer you are to, to having the optimal state there, um, that's, that's great. And then the second element is how do you conserve value? How do you conserve value? Especially it's the, the question is, let's say, very simple if you consider fiat and for instance, Bitcoin, right? Fiat is a net negative. Understanding a bit of economics, understanding inflation, understanding what's happening would lead you to, to conclude that it's not a very smart game to hold fiat, especially when so much fiat is printed, when things were, when fiat is devalued and, and so forth, over time, you would not want to keep a large amount of money in fiat. Um, and then in comparison, Bitcoin would be a lot more valuable. But the question becomes a bit more nuanced and interesting when you have several systems that are deflationary. Suppose you have not only Bitcoin, but you have Ethereum, you have eGold and, and some other currencies as well. All of them are capturing and conserving value in a significantly more robust way than the fiat currencies. But in this particular game, the question is over time, which one will be able to not only conserve, but generate value in a faster and more robust way uh, because if you would conclude that one of them would significantly outpace the other one, then, then you should probably take a look at that. So coming back to your question, the, the thing is um, we've solved 
the exchange money exchange value in a way that's fundamentally superior from an architectural standpoint than anything we have seen in the space until this point. Um, so the throughput is, is more than 1000 X an improvement compared to Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's essentially scalable beyond 100,000 transactions per second um, at which you, you don't really care about the scalability anymore. Then there's the transaction cost, uh, which is essentially super, super small and adjustable. So suppose Elrond goes 100X really fast from here, what happens to the transaction cost? Does it grow 100X? Of course, at first it grows, but this is why you have governance. And we've thought about the economic policy that is upgradable so that it still maintains a level of sustainability that's interesting. And then coming back to, to the security problem, I think there are some very clear assumptions here. Just as you have some assumptions with Bitcoin, outside of which Bitcoin cannot hold as a network, um, in, in the same way you have some assumptions for Elrond. So those assumptions hold true. And once you have a certain level of adoption, this part becomes um, irrelevant as an argument because at the, at the end of the day, is, is it secure enough? And then beyond that point, is it scalable and efficient enough to really adopt, to really accommodate um, yeah, widespread global adoption? That's, that's the really fundamental question. So we've discussed the fact that interoperability is somewhat the future, right? It doesn't have to be one blockchain to rule them all. Everybody can succeed, find their user base and work together. That said, it feels like everybody's doing a different version of the same thing. Right, they're they all they're all nuanced, of course. So when you're building a Dex, you know, an AMM or something, what differentiates it from the existing platforms? Is it the very nature of Elrond itself that makes it superior, or are there new features? When you're thinking about a new product that already exists, what are you trying to mm -hmm. create? Mm -hmm. um, sure, this is this is a great question because to the extent that everyone does essentially the same thing. Um, it doesn't really add too much value. Um, the answer to this is precisely what Elrond um, is focusing on. In fact, we have the properties of the network that, as I said, are scalability and, and um, transaction cost and utility, uh, and then UX. This, I believe, will redefine every project that we are now seeing in the crypto space. If we take DEXs, for instance, what's the breakthrough of a DEX? Well, this is clear. It, it, there's no question at this point that um, automated market makers and DeFi are sort of the one of the first killer applications that validate what blockchain technology is doing and, and so forth. But what's the challenge? Well, first, it's not scalable. On Ethereum, these uh, applications cannot scale. They literally have a limit beyond which they, they can really not uh, move forward. And so solving this limit enables us to, to um, have a much larger opportunity. And then secondly, there are still a very, very limited number of people that are playing with these technologies. Why? Because they're super complex. It's like... Um, even after months and after millions and billions of dollars in, in the DeFi space, the number of people that is playing with these technologies is super limited because it requires rocket science for most of the people to really uh, yeah. look at things uh, deeply. And so what's, what's the Myrdex about? Well, first, it's about scaling things. Once you can really scale things, you have a much larger opportunity. And then secondly, it's about bringing uh, more than 500,000 users that we have in Maya right now, but going to millions and tens of millions and then hundreds of millions of people that can access these products in a very customized, personalized way that they can reason with, understand and, and benefit of. So that's, that's for the DEX. Then for the NFTs, it's the same thing. Yeah. What, what would it mean if you could, on your mobile phone, 
create an NFT, share it with your friends, go through the entire process without having to think about private public keys and, and all of that and, and so forth. Well, it would change the, the experience. And, and with each new product, the same element applies. You just have to look at Apple, right? What, what did they do? Uh, well, precisely this. They, they've taken some technology, put a lot of love into what they did, um, and then essentially created a market where the market was super small and people never thought it would exist in such a large uh, or to such a large extent. So we're just in the day one. People are super excited, overexcited. They would like everybody else to die and, and so forth just because of their excitement for, for their particular ecosystem. But the interesting things for all of these people is what will they do when their ecosystem because, becomes larger than, than everything they've dreamed about? And then the other ecosystem becomes large, super large, crazy large as well. What, what then? Who will you fight at that point? Um, and, and so it's much more important to ask this type of question of what do you want to solve? And once this is solved, what's the end game? How, how will we be able to improve the world further, even bef beyond the DeFi space, beyond the NFT part and, and uh, contribute to what's happening during the next decade? What will we do when there's nothing left to fight about, right? Um, <laughs> but so, so at the end of the day, it's about simplicity and scale. You want your every every person needs to be able to use it, but you also need to yes. know that yes. you're at five hundred thousand now, but at fifty million people, it works the same way, which has been largely a problem yes. for Ethereum. Yes, yes, and and it's not fifty million; it's seven and fifteen transactions right. per second. So it's it's a, a very big difference between here. And what would uh, what we would require for fifty million, and we're we're going there very very rapidly. This is why the excitement is in the air. Why um, the the funds are joining? Why why everyone is super super thrilled? Because we're not only inventing new tools, but improving the fundamentals by which we're we're doing everything we did before. Once you do it, once you can do it one hundred times cheaper. 100 times faster. Everything change changes uh, in, in scale, speed, and, and perception. I, I, I've always viewed you, obviously, as a visionary, as one of those people who is willing to dream sort of uh, bigger, than, bigger than most. So I, I want to ask you, we, we discussed it briefly, but if I'm a 10-year-old in 2021, when I'm 18 and I become an adult and I'm looking for a job, what does my life look like in eight years? Is it fully ready player one? Am I existing in the metaverse with my goggles on and I'm not in the real world? What does my life potentially really look like? Hmm. This eight, is, 10 this years. Is a, yeah, it, it's a super interesting question just because there are so many things that, that right now I see at, at an inflection point. But going beyond those, if there's one thing that's perhaps clearer than anything else, it's that the metaverse will probably be um, a kind of paradigm shift for the world that will come faster than almost any other innovation. Just because of the speed with which we can iterate, the uh, speed at which we can create value, the pleasure we get when, when we play all of this and, and can leave the entire world in this new universe. I do think that uh, if you look at Axie and what they've been doing, it's super intriguing to see um, how blockchain technology has essentially changed a lot of people's lives without having the need to understand how they do it. Like nobody cares if you understand the blockchain technology or not. Um, at that point, when you and your family and your family's friends and so forth can all live day to day, earn their money and so forth by playing a game and earning 10 times what you would in your local economy, that's the point where the world changes in, in uh, one month, 10 years, just like that. So. I, I think this will be, there are many things that will be discussed and debated, uh, whether it's about 
AI, where we are right now, whether it's about genetics and what we'll be able to do uh, with, with CRISPR and, and all this super interesting technologies um, and, and uh, space exploration and whether or not we'll reach Mars until that point and, and uh, we'll have had at least the first contact with, uh, with Mars. What's clear is that the metaverse will 100% be there and it will almost be dangerous because if this becomes super easy in the sense that you can 10 times faster build your wealth, create a life that's more exciting and interesting and so forth, it will be super tricky to go out and visit friends and do some, something else, right? So interesting, interesting problems to have in any case. So maybe I'll be sitting on Mars with our uh, AR, VR goggles on living on Earth <laughs> in, in the metaverse yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and working, might, working might in an art gallery selling my NFTs, right? Might be, might be. There, there are, of course, many things, but of, the money will fundamentally change. In eight years, we'll look, most of the peoples around the world will look very different at money, how they earn it, um, what they do with it, and what value it. It has, as I said, health will be a very different thing because I do think that it's almost super, super clear to me that during my lifetime, um, we're going to live beyond 100. It, it, we, we will have to fail in many things to not improve um, this part. Um, and then the, the AI part, of course, uh, this will be an open discussion that, that can accelerate health, that can accelerate all the other elements as well. But the metaverse, um, yeah, this, there's very little discussion about this because it's here already. We just need to play a bit more with it and, and develop it further. Um, and this will probably come faster than anything else. If you live past 100, 110, 120, 130, then 65 certainly isn't retirement. You need to make money and, and earn yield to survive in very different ways. So the money would have to evolve with those improvements. And I mean, we, I, you know, we talk about amortality, obviously. I don't think anyone will be, ever be immortal, but there's an idea that people could scientifically live forever if they weren't hit by a bus. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. Which... Yeah, increases the challenges for actually being solvent that entire time and, and having money. Yeah, I, I don't think um, I don't think the money part is the most difficult challenge. Interestingly enough, at this point, from from this part part of history, it would seem like that just because of how stupid we were throughout history and uh, recently and so forth. But it almost seems like we're super close to this fundamental shift, almost like a, a, a kind of um, Kardashev scale. There, there's this scale created for, for civilizations that have learned to harness the energy on their planet. That's a level one civilization. Then learn to harness that energy in their solar system. That's level two civilization. And then learn to harness the evers, uh, the energy in their galaxy and, and uh, so forth. I do think that it's like we're on the cusp of creating a Dyson sphere for, for the economy. Uh, once we have this, we'll probably be able to manage money faster, solve the distribution problem faster. And um, just, yeah, I, I don't think everything will be solved. So I'm not saying um, all of a sudden, um, all the problems disappear, but it will fundamentally raise the opportunity bar for everyone along, around the world and then leave open a space for the most ambitious people around the world to, to really uh, break to a point where um, they create more value and, and wealth than anyone throughout history. So as we come to the unfortunate end of this conversation, uh, what are the things that you're most excited about that you want to impart to the audience that maybe I would have missed uh, asking about? I, I think in the immediate uh, future, the immediate period, um, the Elrond ecosystem has never been at a better point than where we are right now. We've exceeded some milestones um, and are preparing for some other milestones that will be far larger than anything we've had until now. 
just as with the launch of Mayar, after one or two weeks after we launched the application, it almost seemed like the last six month, months we've done nothing because the adoption we had in one week where was more than six months, six previous months. Uh, I think with the Mayar Dex, we're going to see so large a uh, utility adoption and usage for the network that it will again seem that after one month, um, almost everything we had since the launch uh, will be like uh, us not doing anything. Uh, so we'll ask what took us so long to actually bring this text live and, and um, harness the, the opportunities that come with it. Then the NFTs again will open some, some super interesting opportunities. Then different adoption vectors in Europe and US will, will make things um, even more interesting. Uh, so the, the immediate period, I think, will, will just be um, pretty insane for, for most people. Uh, and we're, we're pushing super hard on that. But I'm even more um, excited for the medium longer term. Uh, as I said, once we cross some certain thresholds, uh, we're playing a different game. And uh, this will be super interesting for, for us as a space and also for us as humanity. So pretty a pretty great time to be alive i'd say what a time to be alive so where can everybody follow you personally and then obviously check out everything that's happening on elrond um the elrond twitter elrond network and um my twitter at benjamin minku and then um the elrond blog and telegram are are just great places um and super super curious to always hear feedback from the uh, great community we we have around the world. Thank you so much for taking the time. I always find your uh, vision to be refreshing and inspiring, and it it uh, gives a lot of hope. You know, I, I believe for for what can what can happen in the future because it's a rough time for most people. Yeah, a really great conversation, Scott. I I um, do think that things will will get a lot better. So uh, we we do have to push. I'm I'm not saying it's. It's just getting automatically there. It's um, super challenging sometimes, but uh, it does seem like there, there has never been a better time to have this type of conversations and, and put the effort in. Well, to that end, we'll do it again soon. <laughs> round three. <laughs> well, really round Thank four, you. since we did this on a live stream too. But yeah, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is round three. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. <laughs>